from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. Cowboy is wearing a reminder that he's an award-winning horse, and he's being ridden today by Michelle, who won state awards for an event called Steer Dobbing. No such pressure today. This is a pleasure ride. Michelle and Cowboy will demonstrate the various speeds or gates of a horse. After a bit of a warm-up, the first gate or speed that was demonstrated was simply walking the horse. Now she ramps up the speed by going into a gallop. Also known as man's best friend, dogs provide companionship, love, affection, protection, and fun. They are very adaptable to the lives that humans lead. But having pets demands some caring on our parts. These dogs, for example, give all the gifts mentioned above. But they also receive good food, a clean and comfortable shelter, space in which to thrive, and the playful interaction you see here. Let's view a video clip about caring for your pets. pets. Now the use of the word pet in the previous video clip could cause confusion, as when the narrator said to be sure to pet your pet. That's because the word pet can be to different parts of speech. As mentioned earlier, a pet is an animal that has an emotional and often physical connection with the person. Used this way, the word pet is a noun, and nouns name people, places, things, ideas, and concepts. The word pet is also a verb, a word that communicates action. Stroking the fur of a tame animal is petting, so to pet your special furry friend means to stroke its coat. When you do that, you're petting your pet. They're selling kids in my neighborhood. I saw a sign this week offering kids for only $200 a piece. Well, before you get too horrified by people selling kids, I should explain a little bit about the word kids. As an intermediate level English learner, you probably already know that the word for an immature human is child. Now, if there's more than one child, we say children. Now, this is a more formal term. So if you were calling a school, you might ask how your child is doing or how your children are doing. Now, the informal term for child is kid. So maybe you tell your sister on the phone that the kids are doing well in school. So it's understandable that you think it's terrible that people in Southern Oregon are selling kids. What you may not know is that the word kid also refers to a baby goat. In the last segment, we had a quiz to see how many farm animals you could name in English. Now, these are vocabulary words you want to master. Now let's look at some vocabulary you just want to be aware of. Let's go beyond the basic names to specific names. So let's start here. You're familiar with the word cow. The word for a female cow that gives birth is a heifer. The baby is called a calf, and a male cow is called a bull. A chicken that lays eggs is called a hen. The babies that hatch from the eggs are called chicks. A mother pig is called a sow. All these tiny babies are called piglets. A male pig is called a boar. 
The word hen is also used for a mother duck. The babies are called ducklings. In order to research and report on an animal, we'll need to use a number of language functions and connecting words that we can transfer to other subject matter. For consistency, we'll repeatedly use information from wildlife cards like this one. In this episode, our focus is on describing an animal. Now, many people don't have to think twice when asked to describe something, but I've seen eyes glaze over when one of my students was told to describe. Just what does it mean to describe? In the simplest terms, describing an object is to use a set of words that will form a picture in the mind of someone who hears or reads our description. Size, shape, color, features, all these other details are brought into play when it comes to inspiring that mental picture. In this episode, we'll start with a wild animal that's likely to be known by most viewers. We'll start with deer. Now, the English word deer is used for both singular and plural applications. One deer is called a deer, and several of them are also called deer. I saw one deer, my sister saw three deer. Let's watch a video clip about deer and their kin. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we're blessed with these wild animals, black-tailed deer. Okay, these fawns don't look very wild, and there's certainly nothing ferocious about them. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping up your English is also for people of all ages. I'm not going to waste a lot of time because I know you have a lot of painting to do. I do. What, what have you started here? Well, this is um, our, our story is called How Chipmunk Got His Stripes. And in the story, we have a bear, but we actually have a black bear. So um, we've actually painted a beautiful little black bear on our model here. <laughs> that oh, white, look at that. Yeah, it just really kind of pops it out and really makes this cute little bear face. And now let's go ahead and put some... Make a beautiful butterfly today. Oh, yeah. And this is Valerie. This Hi, is our model, Valerie. And how old are you, Valerie? Six. Oh, six. six. Wow. Have you ever had your face painted before? Uh-huh. Okay, you like doing that? Uh-huh. All right. Well, I've welcome. been told she seeks out face painters wherever she goes. Yes, I am. I am Bear. I am Bear. I can do anything. As soon as Bear said those words, a little voice spoke up from the ground. Can you really do anything? Bear looked down. He saw a little brown squirrel standing on his hind legs. Can you really do anything? Brown squirrel asked again. Before written language, knowledge was passed down through stories, sometimes told around the campfire. Now, Some of these stories took the form of folk tales, and many folk tales were about animals. We turned to the folk tale in the last episode. Our good friend Will, who read us a story during our unit on trains and railroads, returned with some friends to deliver a folk tale called How the Chipmunk Got Its Stripes. Following that episode, I tried my own hand at reading a folk tale. Long ago, when the oceans were only half filled with water, in our previous episode, we conducted a short discussion about zoos. Now, we did not engage in the fever pitch attack and counterattack that has unfortunately overtaken public discourse in the United States in recent years. We demonstrated how opposing ideas can be shared in a way that's respectful and enriching. Today, we look at the language needed to participate in discussions. That includes the discussion about zoos. In that episode, we role-played a discussion with my guest, Miss Lisa, presenting the pro side of zoos and myself presenting the con side. In other words, Lisa was all for zoos, I was against them. In the discussion, pro means for and con means against. Here's just the discussion part of episode 47. I want to welcome Miss Lisa to our program. Lisa, welcome to Ramping Up Your English. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Miss Lisa is going to help us model 
do a role play of discussion skills. And we'll just jump right in. So I'll just say, well, we're friends, okay? So, uh, so Miss Lisa, what you got going today? I have a great day planned that's going to be big. I'm going to take my grandson to the Oregon Zoo. Oh. Yeah, I can't wait to see how he interacts and gets to see the animals. What are you doing this afternoon? Well, I'm not doing that. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry at you. Some good effort. Well, they, the, the, no doubt they get an A for effort, <laughs> you know, or E for effort. The, the thing is um, with, the, with the enclosures. Okay, so what we've had here is a real brief discussion about this. And uh, I just want to ch uh, check in on some of the, the parts of being respectful. Uh, did you feel I was respectful as the devil's advocate here? Definitely. Oh, definitely. You didn't make me feel threatened like you had the right or and I was wrong. I, I appreciate that, you know. Yeah. Let's look at some of the language we use in that discussion that took place between Miss Lisa and me. There are two main language objectives in the discussion. One is to give your opinion and the other is to ask for an opinion. Now let's start with offering your own opinion. First, notice that I listened to Miss Lisa's opinion, and I even validated her viewpoint by saying something to the effect of, oh, I'm sure you're going to have a great time at the zoo, especially being there with your grandson. Then I signaled that I'm going to express a contrary view when I added, but I have some doubts about zoos. My concern is, or that's worth thinking about, or I'll consider that. So there are many ways you can use English to invite yourself into a discussion, express and explain your views, and be respectful of others who hold a contrary view. Today, I'm going to have you employ your imagination. See what you can understand in the following video, and most importantly, what you feel at the end of it. Here's the video. You're deep in the forest, warmed by the campfire and your friends. You share stories of outdoor adventures, the unbelievable beauty of the high country, and a few scary stories as well. You excuse yourself from the campfire and lay down to take in the sky on this full moon night. As you watch the clouds skim across the face of the moon, you fade into a deep, contented sleep. All is silent. And then... You bolt awake, your heart racing. You look out at the mountains. You hear it, the distant howl the reply to the wolf just on the edge of your campsite. Your blood is ice water. Oh, there's raw fear, but there's also an overpowering wonder as well. Something deep in you knows this song and knows that it's right. Did you follow what happened in the video? Were you left with a feeling of chill or fear or wonder? I can't honestly say that I've had the experience you just imagined, but I had one that got my heart pumping, the hairs on my back standing up, and a sense of wonder and even awe. It wasn't from a wolf, it was from a coyote. Well, one way scientists uh, research the diet of an animal is to collect its scat. So this is what scat is. So the scat is a substance that's excreted from the end of the animal's digestive system to jettison the undigested food. It's the animal's poop. Now this is some scat I collected when hiking in southern Oregon near Ashland. It appears to be the scat of a coyote or perhaps some other carnivore. Now how can I tell? Look at the fur in this scat as I pull it apart. These tiny plants are called phytoplankton. The tiny animals that feed on them are called zooplankton. Let's learn more about these tiny drifters. Let's look at tiny living things that form the base of the ocean food web. I hope this episode on animal diets doesn't make you too hungry. 
If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 65. Most people are fascinated by the ocean. Perhaps it's the fact that our oceans are the cradle of life on our planet. Or maybe it's the way the ocean engages so many of our senses. It's such a different place than places where most people live. Besides engaging our imagination, the edge of the ocean is where many people find deep rest and healing. Sometimes the ocean can seem devoid of life, but we know better than that. What forms of life live under those waves? It's said that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about our own oceans. From the coast of Oregon, we enjoy sweeping views of our Pacific Ocean. Well, our great views often include ocean animals like seals and sea lions. In our last episode, we learned about seals and sea lions. Then we listed adaptations of harbor seals, followed by a list of how those adaptations gave harbor seals an advantage in their marine environment. We used the connecting words and phrases that put these facts together in a way that shows cause and effect relationship between the facts. In this episode, we'll take a closer look at those connecting words and we'll learn some more about this whole concept of adaptations. Now, in our last segment, we listed five physical adaptations that harbor seals have. Then we listed the advantages that are gained by having these adaptations. We showed how to connect those facts in a way that shows a cause-effect relationship. Let's quickly review how we did that. Notice the words in large print. Those are the connecting words that show cause-effect relationship between the facts. Harbor seals have powerful hind flippers, which allows them to swim fast so they can catch prey and escape predators. Now, here's a list that has those connecting words. The first two on the list are the most common for the function of linking cause and effect when it comes to an animal's adaptations. The word allow or allows can be used in several ways with other words. The other common connector is the phrase, so they can. Now you can also use the phrase, in order to. Use these connecting words to illustrate the cause-effect relationship in the physical adaptation section of your report on the animal of your choice. Now these key words and phrases are critical to communicating a cause-effect relationship. What could be more central to science? Science can be seen as exploring and testing the relationship between cause and effect. Now you may think of science as being an academic matter or a professional concern. Well, it is both of those. But science, the tested and true relationship between cause and effect, is critical to our role as citizens of our community, nation, and world. There are a lot of so-called facts being communicated through social media, misinformation and falsehoods designed to trick us into supporting those who are working against our interest and the health of our communities. There are some very dark agendas being carried out, and they depend on sowing confusion in the minds of people. Now, this situation has made it impossible for us to have a national discourse on issues that matter. From Russian hackers to TV networks masquerading as news outlets, many people in the United States, including political leaders, are embracing beliefs that have no relationship to reality. The antidote to this dangerous situation is a skeptical approach. Is there a true cause-effect relationship between the pieces of information we're given? It's like my old biology professor insisted we ask the question, where's the proof for that? Mm -hmm.